May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and strength. Amen. I may have told you, some of you, this story which I heard a long time ago when the German Protestant Church made a donation to the church in Namibia at a time when the War of Independence, which was a guerrilla war, was still in progress there. The German church officials were therefore worried that the monies which came from Germany would be used for military equipment and to fuel the flames of fire. So they sent the gift with a rather long gift tag, stipulating that the money should only be used for medical purposes, education or social care. To the consternation of the church, the German church, the money came back with a message. If you are fellow brothers in Christ, and sisters too, cannot trust us to use this gift for the building of the kingdom of God, then we would rather not have it at all. Have you ever been offered a gift you decided to refuse? Because in accepting it, you would have condoned it or accepted certain kinds of treatment or opinions. Gifts are not always free. Even birthday gifts confirm relationships. And while we say it is the thought that counts, not all thoughts are worth thinking. And while we say we cannot look a gift horse in the mouth, we can refuse gifts which are insulting or contrary to our values and beliefs. But gifts at their best are expressions of love, affirming bonds and relationships. In the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, he writes for two chapters about giving and never mentions money once. An observation by Professor Tom Wright. Paul is in the process of gathering a large gift from the Gentile Christians in aid of the poor Christians of Jerusalem. Paul and the Christians of Corinth do this because they know themselves as part of the new creation living not in the old ways, but as people recreated, reborn, as brothers and sisters of people far away, the Christians in, the, in Jerusalem. Most importantly, this collection is for Paul not an act of duty, but a response and res expression of God's gift to them, the gift of love shared amongst equals. And we here are part of that gathering too, equals in the sight of God. And hence, in the Church of Scotland, we still speak of the free will offering. We are free to give, not duty bound. It matters to Paul how we give. Duty is not good enough. This money embodies for him the unity between the people of God. And remember that this unity is not a given or an easy option. Paul and the Jerusalem Christians have quite different interpretations of the gospel at the time. There, is a, there was a big debate going on whether Christians ought to be circumcised or not whether they should be made to keep the Jewish regulations from the Old Testament or whether they were superseded. The collection Paul was gathering signified the belonging together in their love and care with the Jewish, of the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. 
And Paul explains and describes the reason for this free giving in verse 9. It is the grace of Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Now that's difficult for us, isn't it? How can poverty lead to richness? Certainly, our society lives by the mantra, nothing comes from nothing. Hence, how can poverty lead to richness? In our gospel today, Mark shows us an intertwined story, a double story of healing. And in it shows us what this meant for one poor woman and one rich man. The woman, as we heard, had suffered for 12 years, spent all her money on treatment, but the condition only got worse. This meant she was excluded from all ritual worship activities and much of social life. With the courage born from despair, she pushes through the crowd and touches Jesus' cloak and is healed. And Jesus feels it. He stops, although he's on an urgent mission, and calls out to the person who touches him, calls for her to step forward. Somebody wrote, a survivor of incest once told me that this is her conversion passage. Her voice cracked and tears came to her eyes as she said, Jesus was willing to empty himself, to let go of his power in such a dramatic way that he felt it draining from him. For this woman, it took an immense emptying to heal her immense shame. And he is willing to do that for me too. Jesus praises the woman's faith and she leaves healed, made whole, a complete human being, rich. And at the same moment, Jairus, synagogue ruler of standing, becomes poor. Your daughter has died. The messengers tell him it's the worst news any parent could receive. And that was the end of the busy, efficient, hoping Jairus had entertained. Jesus had been dawdling on the road with a no-name woman. But Jesus ignores the messengers of doom and encourages poor Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. And you know the rest of the story leaving Jairus and his wife completely astonished and enriched in a new way. Rich and poor, poor and rich. What does it mean? You'll all know instances where the richest people in the world were the poorest in spiritual terms and on the other way around as well where the poorest financially were the richest in love and sharing although if your belly aches because you're hungry if your home is bombed and your family freezing it is your physical needs which need addressing first and because of that Jesus brought good news, first of all, for the poor. Mother Teresa once told of taking some rice to a poor Hindu family who had not eaten for days. She handed the rice to the mother of the family, who at once put half of it into another bowl and rushed out to take it to her neighbors, a Muslim family. When she returned, Mother Teresa remonstrated with her. 
Now there's hardly enough for you. There are ten of you. How could you do this? The mother answered, They don't have anything to eat either. Jesus and following him, Paul, is in the process of changing our hearts and minds, our worldview. Money to spare in the bank, houses, cars, and cupboards filled with things equates for most people being rich. Paul applies a new yardstick. He knows that Jesus was truly rich, being of God's nature, and in human terms became poor. He didn't come as a lord, a human lord, in a palace, a stable place sufficed. He didn't come to the capital, Jerusalem, but had to live in a small place in Galilee. He didn't come with armies and guards, instead only used love and friendship as his tools to form relationships, defend himself, live. Those who follow Jesus are asked, like the poor woman, to reach out and touch in faith and become rich, not in monetary terms, but rich in love shared. And when we love with God's love, we will be freed from our materialistic prisons and instead share generously. This is what Paul believes. Paul describes for us the aim of giving. The aim of giving is not to make some rich while others become poor. But as it says in the story in Exodus, when the children of Israel were gathering the manna to keep them alive and fed, he that gathered much did not have too much, and he that gathered little did not have too little. Equality was the aim. Need is quelled. Last week, we heard in the news of a town in Germany called Passau, near the Austrian border. I don't know if you heard it. Hundreds of people arrive there every day after being trafficked from all the way from Iran and Afghanistan and other places. They regard Passau as the gateway to Germany. One in 10 is a child. They come all the way having paid lots of money to be put there and then have to walk along the motorway into Passau. Passau had set aside a lot of money for new flood defenses. The money is being spent fast on dealing with refugees. Hungary too is feeling overrun and planning to erect a 13 foot high fence over 100 miles along the border with Serbia. Italy and Greece we have in the news constantly, and those of you who have recently come from or traveled to France through the tunnel have seen the camp or the people from the camp trying to hitch a lift on one of the lorries. With wars in Iraq and Syria, Sudan and Eritrea, large groups of people are still being made homeless and destitute and are trying to find a place to live. Our societies are struggling for a solution. And what is a Christian response to such misery? I read what Pope Francis said. You pray for the hungry, then you feed them. That is how prayer works. The poor found in Jesus the source for courage, for healing, inclusion, justice and peace, they found good news. The rich found and find him a challenge. The young man seeking eternal life is asked not just to obey the Ten Commandments, but to give up his wealth and follow Jesus. Jesus himself said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. 
but what doesn't belong to God. Poor, bereft Jairus, following rabbinic law, should have turned on his heel after it became clear that Jesus had been touched by an unclean woman. But Jairus, too, acts with the courage of despair and leaving the old yardstick behind, dared to trust radically and found new life and a new way. In the 1980s, Muriel Orevillo Montenegro lived with her family in the Philippines in a slum of a small city. Their family's income was very low. They made hardly ends meet. Her neighbors were mostly laundry women, motor cab drivers, vendors. Children were malnourished and protein-rich foods were expensive. There were protests and Muriel tried to teach her children and her neighbors the connection between a simple lifestyle and sharing, these being basically rooted in the teaching of Jesus. We started a tradition, she says, of sharing with our neighbors rice, fish, meat, or anything when our family would receive anything, like unexpected money that I earned from extra work. One day, her husband, a pastor, brought home a two-kilo bag of peanuts, and Muriel was really looking forward to making peanut butter with it to feed their two children, one aged two and Nabi aged four. When she came home that evening, home from work, and approached her neighborhood, everybody smiled at her and said, thank you, thank you. And Muriel got more and more puzzled. So when somebody else said, nanai, which means mother, thank you, she stopped and said, um, why are you thanking me? Her neighbor, Joy, said, oh, Nabi, your son, went around distributing peanuts. The peanuts were good. Trying to hide her shock, she said, you're welcome. Muriel was in a turmoil, whether to be angry or proud of her son. At home, she looked into the bag and, just, and found just two cups of peanuts left. Calling her son, she asked him, why did you give away the peanuts? Did you not know that I wanted to make peanut butter with it for you and your brother? With the pride of a four-year-old who has achieved something, he said, I shared them with our neighbors. I thought we had too much. Muriel wrote, I heard him, but I heard him hard. It is easy for us adults to say or preach about sharing, but to practice it, practice it is difficult. If people only take seriously the principle of simple lifestyle and share and globalize it, instead of globalizing the greed for profit at the expense of many, wouldn't this be a wonderful world to live in? It's a paradox, but Jesus is right. We need to become like children. For indeed, little children lead us with their simple and innocent wisdom. May we, like this child, and as Paul exhorts, share our plenty out of love. And may we, like the woman, and like Jairus, radically trust Jesus, that he will fill us with his enriching love and use us to build his kingdom among us, that one day all the world will live in God's shalom. Amen. <laughs>